Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ahmed Naimi. I'm the head of digital transformation, project management, and real estate at the DIBF. Um, uh, we are actually going to run our second uh, in the series in the real estate talks. And I'm just going to give you a brief about uh, the DIBF just prior to uh, starting so we can have more people actually joining us as we go along. Um, the Bahrain Institute of Banking and Finance, I, I hope you see this screen. Uh, the Bahrain uh, Institute of Banking and Finance has been uh, uh, in business for the last 40 years, so since our inception in 1981. We are actually under the Central Bank of Bahrain, so we are affiliated and governed by the Central Bank of Bahrain. We have trained over 360,000 students in various areas throughout our years, and a lot of, uh, uh, of you don't know that we actually are a global institute rather than just a, a, a local institute where we, tra we uh, travel uh, across the world in terms of sending our trainers in order for them to actually deliver certain uh, uh, topics or, or um, areas of focus like Islamic finance, the latest being uh, the training in Japan uh, just prior to the COVID situation. Um, at the same time, we have about global trust from the World Bank, Amazon Web Services, Islamic Development Bank, and uh, as we offer around 600 plus programs at the BIBF. Um, just briefly, this is basically the countries that we, we deliver training at. Uh, talking about the, also the topic today about the smart and sustainable buildings and uh, uh, smart cities. We are happy to announce that by the summer of this year, inshallah, by the end of the summer this year, we are going to move to our new building, the BRBF building. It's located at a prime location at the Bahrain Bay seafront. And it's going to be a state-of-the-art facility with uh, all the sustainability elements embedded into it. Um, this is basically the look from the outside of the building. These are some of the facilities that are going to uh, be provided from a state-of-the-art classrooms, auditorium, uh, student uh, facilities, and with uh, different aspects. This is sort of the uh, live view of the picture. However, this is quite a little outdated as we speak now. I did not take new pictures yet. So uh, this is around a month and a half back. Um, currently, the building is complete, nearly complete. And we are actually at the finishing stage from the, uh, the internal finishing stage of the building. Um, this is basically the, the look of the solar panels that we're actually currently fixing on top of the uh, parking uh, lot of the uh, building alongside with the rooftop where we're trying to do a sort of power conservation and uh, as it is a green building we are trying to use as much as we can in terms of those uh, aspects. The BIBF we have a number of centers at the BIBF and uh, we are always known as the banking and finance however we offer way more than that so banking and finance being the heart of the BIBF we offer Islamic finance, leadership and management, where we offer a lot of HR, uh, uh, PR, marketing programs, uh, executive education, uh, insurance. We have digital transformation and project management, real estate center, where we offer a different uh, variety of courses when it comes to technology for business users, we talk, uh, project management programs, and also a, uh, the real estate uh, uh, section. In terms of, we talk about the real estate, uh, just prior to uh, moving to our topic, we offer a number of programs when it comes to real estate uh, area. So we talk about the valuation. Uh, we have a number of programs when, when, we wanted to, uh, when we discuss valuation. We have programs in brokerage and sales, owners association, and also property and facility management. And of course, we would not have been able to deliver uh, the range of programs that we have without our partners, strategic partner, the Real Estate Regulatory Authority, who has been doing a lot for Bahrain in terms of uh, regulating the, uh, the profession and also bringing uh, a sort of state-of-the-art know-how in terms of uh, real estate and prop tech and uh, especially with the, new, with the national real estate plan that we, they just recently announced. Um, alongside that, we have other partners like uh, Community Association Institute, RICS and Institute of Real Estate Management, who we work with in order for us to actually deliver these professional qualifications. Um, without further ado, I want to get back to the subject of today. Um, we are going to talk about the smart and sustainable real estate in downtown areas, how profit and sustainability can increase through air zoning. 
joining us today uh, will be Dr. Uh, Dr. Sheikha Fayel Khalifa, who is the director of e-learning center at the University of Bahrain. She is also the assistant professor in the Department of Architecture and Interior Design at the College of Engineering. Uh, she holds a master's degree in building con uh, conservation and urban regeneration, and also a PhD in sustainable urbanism. Her research aspires to contribute to the understanding of smart, sustainable urbanism within the context of transformed cultures. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm going to actually leave the floor to Dr. Fail Khalifa. We're going to have a session of uh, around 30 to 45 minutes, uh, and following that, we're going to start. We are going to actually have a sort of a Q and A for 15 minutes before we end the session. So, if you have any questions, please send us the, your questions through the Q and A section in uh, Zoom. And well, I'm going to ask all the, the relevant questions for Dr. Fay towards the end of the session. Thank you so much, and the floor is yours, Dr. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for the lovely introduction and uh, for letting us see the great work that BIBF is doing. And I'm actually really glad that you presented the project, the, the building of BIBF, inshallah, the new building, because I'm going to talk about it in my presentation uh, today, this morning. Uh, good morning to, uh, to you all. And it is really an honor for me to speak to you here today. Uh, I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. Uh, there is a, the QR code uh, in the screen if you would like to scan it that has my uh, details if you'd like to contact me and I'm also presenting the same code at the end of the presentation inshallah so if you didn't have the time to scan it now you can scan it later. Uh, I am really glad to be sharing my thoughts with you here today about smart sustainable real estate or smart sustainable cities. And uh, particularly, I'd like to shed light on how profit and sustainability can increase through air zoning. Um, uh, zoning is something that is very important for newly developed areas, especially such as Bahrain Bay. Therefore, we're going to talk about three projects in Bahrain Bay. So this is how the flow of the presentation is going to go. We're going to start with uh, some definitions of what sus uh, smart sustainable urbanism is, <clears throat> or what smart sustainable cities are. And uh, what is planning for mixed use? How do we plan for mixed use and how do we uh, do it uh, correctly? And uh, what is uh, planning at the vertical and the horizontal axis? We all know the conventional planning and I'm going to shed some light on it now, but what does it mean to have vertical planning for vertical urbanism or vertical cities or skyscrapers? Uh, what is urban planning and how does it work? We're going to talk about this today. And then I'm going to discuss three different projects in the uh, Bahrain Bay area. And we're going to talk about how can we use air planning to improve their profitability and sustainability. There will be some takeaways and conclusions, inshallah, towards the end of the presentation. So smart sustainable urbanism or smart sustainable cities, a lot of people ask what is the difference between urbanism and cities. Cities is the, is the physical infrastructure of the city itself, its component, while as urbanism is the life in urban areas. So it includes more than that, and we're going to see how that um, is uh, throughout the presentation today, uh, inshallah. So it is a holistic approach to urbanism, uh, talking about smart and sustainability together, because we all know what smart cities are and what sustainable cities are, but what are smart sustainable cities? Today, uh, in any conversation about sustainability or smartness, you cannot really talk about smartness without talking about sustainability. And you cannot talk about sustainability without talking about smartness. So uh, in the last decade, we've seen that these uh, two terminologies, the smart and the sustainable, are coming much closer together in the literature. Uh, we, are, we would like to think about the city of more than just the people and the infrastructure that is in it. That is, um, in it. We are, would like to also talk about the flora and the fiona. Therefore, smart sustainable urbanism has been redefined to the more than human definitions of it. So this is the final definition of uh, smart sustainable cities as we would like to look at it in light of this presentation. It is an urban locality functioning as a healthy system of systems. So it's a combination of systems that are working together in a healthy way uh, to, to satisfy the five pillars of sustainability, the economic, the social, the cultural, the government, and, um, uh, uh, and the ecological. Uh, we would like to generate uh, desired outcomes and futures for all humans and non-humans in the city. 
So uh, there are several publications on that topic and fusion between smartness and, uh, and sustainability in the city. So if you look into the screen here, from big data to analytics to uh, polycentric cities, to the idea of sharing communities or circular communities, to smart growth and sustainable transport in cities, and so on and so forth. And case studies, there are books that are published about smart sustainable cities in India, smart sustainable cities in China, and so on and so forth. And there's even a... Uh, a newly founded uh, journal uh, that is uh, specifically targeting smart and sustainable built environments. So if you're interested in any uh, of that, uh, you can capture the screen and uh, look up those resources because they have uh, quite some uh, good information in them. So now back to the uh, topic of this presentation, we're talking about mixed use or land use and land planning and highlight of uh, smart sustainable cities. Land use is the total arrangement and act, uh, activities and inputs that people undertake in a certain land type or defining that land type to begin with. And the concept first emerged more than 10,000 um, years ago. So it's a very long concept. Uh, the simplest idea of planning uh, for land use is um, as such. I, I get that some of the audience here are not from a planning or architectural background. So this is the simplest way to put it. So a planner would have a piece of land vacant, they would go and subdivide that piece of land and they would allocate um, uses for that land. So they'd say houses go here and here, uh, parks go here, schools or institutions go there, uh, you need at least one hospital within that, uh, that uh, radius and so on and so forth. So this is the conventional horizontal planning that we all know of. <clears throat> but what is vertical um, urbanism in light to that planning? Now, Talking about horizontal planning is not good enough when you're talking about vertical urbanism or vertical cities or downtown areas. Uh, there has been a lot of talks about how urban density is such a quite strong indicator for sustainability. You can't really be sustainable in a suburban area and we're gonna show why. It's not really feasible and it's not really environmentally friendly. Uh, there are a lot of contributions to energy saving and uh, reducing the need uh, for travel when you're in dense downtown areas rather than in suburban areas. If we look at the cost of uh, living um, in an urban area or in a, a suburban area per household, you will need to allocate uh, you know, more piping system, more infrastructure, more roads uh, for those who are in suburban areas rather than in urban areas. You will need uh, more fire departments, longer trips for the police, therefore more cars, more uh, police force, um, a larger number of school buses, and so on and so forth. So it shows you here in the uh, graph that I'm presenting you, or the picture that I'm presenting you on the, in the screen here, that almost double the, the cost of living in urban areas is the living uh, per household for suburban areas. Therefore, it's very important to talk about downtown areas um, uh, when we're talking about smart sustainability. Now, what is vertical urbanism in that sense? The same example that we've explained before, you have a plot of land, it has been subdivided, but then you have skyscrapers. Skyscrapers meaning that you're not spreading horizontally, but spreading vertically. So you're spreading in the air. And you are really taking a smaller footprint, but really increasing in the population size that is inhabiting that smaller footprint. Therefore, the conversation comes um, about, okay, how can we plan that and the vertical access? Uh, right now, the planning regulations are very loose in that regard, so we're still uh, giving them a special project uh, definition, and uh, the developer comes, and the architect comes, and the consultant, and they decide what sort of facilities they want to introduce to that plot. And uh, there is no really cooperation or between the different plots in one area. Therefore, you end up with a lot of problems that we're going to explain in the presentation. So as an example, vertical planning would be something of like this. You have plot one, plot two, and plot three that are adjacent to each other. And then the regulator or the planning uh, authority would come and say, okay, for, for uh, we would like in that area or in that four set of buildings that have that number of inhabitants to have retail units um, in the lower floors of those two plots, and then offices uh, in these plots, um, uh, health in the central plot so that uh, each of those plots would have uh, an access of maximum 15 minutes to the closest health center that provides the necessary, um, um, you know, important health uh, checkups and, uh, you know, band-aids and, uh, 
and so on and so forth. You would have a primary school within a five minutes radius and then residential units. So now we're talking about planning, not in a horizontal way, but in a vertical way. So a person who's buying a plot number one would know that they would have to have retail offices and residential. Given that all of these plots have a maximum um, height, uh, for instance, we're talking about between 50 and 53 stories height, each one of them is four meters um, in depth and so on and so forth. So we are here looking at the regulation in a different way. Uh, sort of speaking. Now, this is not a new idea, uh, by all means. Um, here in the screen, you can see an advertisement by Gray Cigarettes um, in the 1920s. And this is how they imagined London to be in the year 2500. We're talking here about the beginning of the 20th century, so a very, very long time ago. But these ideas um, came in the minds of uh, those who are concerned about the future of the city and planning in, the, in that sense. Um, again, some interesting images. The, the one on the left is from 1910, and again, it uh, shows this uh, reality of the city and how they are seeing the, the city as a set of layers. And what is more interesting, if you look at the one in the right hand side, uh, may, live to, may live to see, may solve congestion problems. They were talking about congestion problems uh, in, the, in the beginning of the 20th century, 1925. And this is how they imagined cities to be in the 1950s. Today we're in 2021 and we're nowhere near that. So they're talking about, if you see here uh, down, I don't know if you see my pointer, but the um, uh, electric trains and uh, uh, in the very lower uh, part of the city, and then on the top layer, you have uh, fast uh, motor traffic followed by slow motor traffic, by followed by the open uh, to the sky, which is the level for pedestrians. And then the same idea that I was presenting to you earlier in the simplest graph, uh, the restaurants being in the lower ground floor where the pedestrians are, and then followed by offices, by schools, and then living quarters and playgrounds. So this idea existed in the 1920s. Why have we not yet reached to that? This is the, what we're going to talk about today. So talking about Bahrain Bay and Bahrain in particular, if we look at to uh, Bahrain Bay, Bahrain, of course, it is one of the recently developed uh, areas in Bahrain, and it is um, really something to, to talk about when you're talking about planning or uh, newly developed downtown areas, because it is the downtown area in Bahrain now. In a survey that we have conducted in Bahrain, we've seen that uh, the average daily commute time for individuals in Bahrain is 63 minutes. So that's 38 minutes daily from work or uh, from home to work or to school and 21 minutes to the gym from work or from homes. Now, comparing that to the international situation, we're not doing very bad. 63 minutes average daily commute is still not very bad in comparison, for example, to 30 minutes in Hong Kong and 90 minutes in Tokyo. So we're, we're somewhere in the average uh, in, in global cities, but we don't want that number to increase further high. So we would like to think about, OK, how in our newly developed downtown areas such as Bahrain Bay, we can reduce that travel time as much as possible by introducing mixed use as much as possible. Um, it is not a surprise to anyone here, I think, that uh, in our survey we found out that 98.3% uh, of participants travel mainly by car. Uh, what is surprising to, is to see that 5.1% identified walking to be their primary mode of transportation. I was thinking this is maybe of the expats who are living near where they work and they don't really uh, navigate through this, the Bahrain much or the city much. 3.9% uh, identified cycling uh, to be their primary mode of transportation. So what is the case of Bahrain Bay in that highlight? So we have in Bahrain Bay, again, Ahmed, as you presented here, this is the idea of uh, building to the top left-hand side of the, of the slide. So we have several buildings that are either residential or recreational, like the Four Seasons and um, um, commercial, for instance, like uh, uh, the avenues or offices, like our capitals building, uh, uh, Baraka um, or Windham Tower and so on and so forth. So each building has a typology, um, but it, how mixed are these really in their, in their insight? I mean, if each building is going to work separately and then we're going to fix them again or mix them again at the horizontal level, we're much confined. So if we are thinking about the concept that I presented earlier and the real situation that we have in Bahrain Bay, we can see that we're not really mixed use in that sense. 
So let's have a look at residential projects in Bahrain. We have three uh, great projects coming up, almost uh, finishing Water Bay, one Bahrain Bay, which is called Onyx, I think now, and Golden Gate, Gate project. So all of these are residential towers. If they are at their full occupancy, they're supposed to have a large number of inhabitants. So those inhabitants um, that are living in those three big projects would have to have access to a healthcare facility, uh, to a grocery shop, to a bakery, uh, to uh, a barber shop or a salon for their daily needs or weekly needs. So a small comparison between the three, and I'd like you to focus just on the services aspects of these. So Golden Gate have a cinema, games and recreational area, gym, a business center, boardroom, executive club, conference room, pool, spa, and so on and so forth. Uh, Water Bay again has a cinema, has a gym, has a nursery, prayer room, swimming pool, and so on. And the third one, one Bahrain, they also has a cinema and games recreation area. How many cinemas do you really need in such a small space with such a small number of inhabitants? And without mentioning any names, we all know of real estate projects around Bahrain that does have a cafe, for instance. And the cafe keeps changing because the person who runs that cafe and wants to operate it for that tower ends up knowing that, uh, well, there's not enough revenue because they're only uh, servicing that tower particularly and there is no much uh, uh, service uh, to be provided to the customers in that tower. So is this really the best business model that we can work with? And is this really profitable for both the developer and the people who are going to be renting or buying those units? This is something to think about. And what if we uh, used the same model that I presented er earlier of the air, air planning to decide that, okay, only Golden Gate would get the cinema, only the plot where Bahrain, uh, one Bahrain uh, Bay would have um, a large gym and a recreational area, for instance, and Water Bay would have to have a health center somewhere or a bakery somewhere. This will help really the area become more sustainable, more smart in its operation. Now, there are four takeaways from this analysis that we can think about. Um, the overlap in the facilities are provided, although could provide the developer with uh, short-term benefits in terms of um, stronger sales at the time of the selling of the project, because they can compete with the, uh, with the adjacent project and the, and the facilities that they provide. But is it really on the long run, uh, term beneficial to, or economically beneficial for both the developer and the inhabitants of the area and their health and well-being? Uh, developers were generally not in favor of the idea of air planning because it will uh, just enforce uh, a lot more restrictions to them and will control their freedom of choice and the, and the plots that they would buy. And this is uh, really understandable. But uh, are they more uh, reluctant to change that model if they were introduced to the long-term benefits of this? Air use planning could uh, help developers. We've seen that. It could help developers protect their property values in the long run, while as well maintaining sustainability by, uh, first of all, keeping un unsuitable uses uh, out of the area and also ensuring that tenants have a quick access to various vital facilities. So a tenant today, if uh, they were given a choice to live in an apartment where they, would have, they, where they would have a quick access to a bakery, to a grocery shop, to a retail center, uh, to a healthcare facility and to a primary school, would they choose that? Or would they choose to be isolated in a tower that only have a specific number of facilities, but only him and the people who are living in that tower can use? Now, this is something that needs to be investigated. Through uh, air zoning, developers will be assured that uh, development uh, next door will not have the exact, the exact facilities as they are. Therefore, the competition and provision of services will listen. But this could also push the developers in uh, competing in other ways, like the outside look of the building or the location or the selection of that plot that would have that particular uh, facility. So uh, to conclude here, um, I'd like to think of uh, skyscrapers as the new uh, future for our cities, and uh, it is really the way to go. Uh, they house a large number of populations in what is known today as the vertical cities. Uh, our study suggests that the users must be controlled both vertically and horizontally, not only horizontally, to be uh, able to achieve smart, sustainable uh, urbanism solutions. 
And today, advanced technologies can help in that. I mean, uh, instead of a human planner sits on a table with papers to define which goes where and uh, what facilities to introduce and which plot, today we can generate that uh, electronically using uh, machine learning and using artificial intelligence. We feed this information into a computer and uh, give it the, the piece of land that needs the division, and then the computer would know uh, how to divide it both vertically and horizontally, allocating services in the sense that each human being inhabiting each apartment in that tower would have a five minute access um, to a grocery shop, to a bakery, to a primary school, and uh, for example, a healthcare center within 15 minutes walk. The current urban system in Bahrain, like many other countries in the world, does not currently adopt sustainable mixed use principles, although we are going through that uh, gradually, but uh, we're not doing this uh, as of now. And overlap, uh, overlap in some of the uses and lack of others um, exist, as I presented. That suggests a better coordination efforts could be made uh, to ensure that this happens. Much of the criticism of air zoning comes from the fear of the added restrictions that would uh, violate property rights uh, for developers uh, specifically, and this could be negotiated. And the designs of tall buildings in downtown areas around the world are mainly controlled by the building developers and architects, which shouldn't be the case because now we're talking about vertical cities. The little control that is enforced uh, and on the users or facilities within the plot, I think is causing more problems than is causing benefits to either the developer, the country or the people inhabiting the plot. And uh, this results in repetitive facilities as I have presented that are underutilized and the lack of other crucial facilities that are very important. I'd like to leave you with this quote here uh, today uh, to talking about again, smart and sustainable cities. A smart city is a city where humans, trees, birds, and other animals can grow with all their glories, imperfections, freedoms, and creativity. They're not just cities of technology, but cities of love, life, beauty, dignity, freedom, and equality. I'd like to leave you with this today. Thank you very much. And here's the QR code again and my information if you'd like to capture the screen to get in touch. And back to you, Ahmed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicola. Thanks so much for this uh, presentation and the uh, new information that actually it's quite new to me as well. Um, I'm gonna open up the floor for questions. Um, just while you um, yeah, at least write your questions, I have a question for you, Doctor. Um, why are we lagging in building smart cities in Bahrain and the sort of the region? Why are we or what are we? Why are we lagging? Uh, oh. as we see that we have sort of a, we are lagging when, when it comes to smart cities and all that. Why are we lagging in your opinion? Well, smart cities, I mean, talking about cities in general, whether smart or not smart, uh, is a very complex issue because you have a lot of stakeholders, you have a lot of things to consider, and it's not something that happens, um, you know, in a daytime. It's something that takes years and years, and cities are, um, you know, works of generations after generations. So changing anything within the city or trying to change the city in any way takes a very long time and takes a lot of brave decisions and uh, someone who's uh, who can see that vision happening in the future. So I think we're lagging because um, there was not that build up knowledge. Uh, but now that we are seeing that and now that we have uh, a lot more national calibers, I mean, talking about Bahrain uh, in 2006, 2007, when we had that um, you know, 2030 vision and we had that implementation plan, we did put forward an implementation plan to be more sustainable, although that was focused on economic sustainability, but regardless, there was not much implementation because there's uh, no one who knows how to implement it, who to knows how to implement it locally. So I think that goes back also to the people who are uh, in-house in the country who can implement such solutions. And we're seeing that grow uh, gradually in Bahrain and we have, um, for example, more programs in our institutions that graduate people who can uh, work on these uh, issues. And uh, up until they, inshallah, reach up on their ladder uh, of work to positions where they can do that, we will start to see changes in our cities. Correct. And uh, so basically, do you see a sort of a sort of a lack of awareness and proper education when it comes to smart cities? This is what you're 
Advice Today, I don't think that we have lack of awareness. We all know the different technologies available. People are talking about uh, data analytics and blockchain and all of these uh, things, whether they understand them or not. I don't think the awareness is the issue, but it is knowing how to implement the know-hows is still a bit missing. It is growing, but it's still a bit missing. And also the difficulties with the legislations and uh, the longer time it takes with the bureaucracy and so on to change them. Correct. Um, I have a question from uh, uh, Mr. Hashem Kazan. Do you think this uh, should be a policy driven at a government level to speed up the adoption of smart cities? I think it would, uh, yes, I would believe so. Um, it would have to come from the regulator, but it will also come from um, other parties like NGOs, people who care about this uh, and would like to see it uh, happen in their country. Uh, educational institutions uh, that are with their research would like to push the government to have those and enforce those regulations and also awareness for the developers because uh, you know we they need to see the long-term positivity of it and uh, they wouldn't be able to see that unless we provide them with the evidence and the research that shows them that uh, you don't worry about your privacy and your property don't worry about long-term plans and your short-term profitability as well this could happen Correct. Um, I, I, I believe you are on the board of the Smart City uh, Society as well, Victoria, right? Yes. So uh, what are you guys in terms of the society doing uh, to support that uh, sort of vision or uh, the goal towards uh, sustainable and smart cities? I, I'm still very young to the board. I've just joined them, but I can say, I mean, it's really glad. I'm really glad to uh, see that uh, to begin with we do have uh, a society that is concerned about smart cities this is a very good uh, start uh, where things happen of course there are a lot of initiatives um, uh, there's a conference that is happening in november inshallah about smart sustainable cities uh, so it is really heartwarming to see that there is now attention to those terminologies uh, together uh, in light of the cities uh, so this could also um, you know highlight and spread some awareness about the importance of talking about smartness and sustainability together uh, in relationship to the city so there are great initiatives that are coming inshallah from the society so nice um joan is mentioning our developers and planners should take a lesson from some cities and its mega towers planning um uh, it's quite interesting um, we have a question also from Majid, who says, how far we, are, we in, our Bahrain, in Bahrain have applied international standards of smart, sustainable approach? Is there a plan which is applied? Oh, very interesting question. Uh, there is no local uh, definition for what we think smart and sustainability should be. And we're trying to do that with the research now. Uh, we worked on a number of indicators to define locally what we mean by smart sustainable cities and how can we measure them? How can we know that uh, Bahrain have achieved this in terms of their sustainability? Uh, we're right now we're working on ISO standards um, as, a, as a benchmark and we're trying to see whether they fit our needs or not. And uh, we did really do a lot of surveys about that and I do have one published paper about that as well and one coming on the way. Uh, talking about which of those ISO indicators is really most appropriate for Bahrain, uh, because different cities are different and those international standards are really hard to just take and mimic in a local condition where in Bahrain, for example, we have um, we have a high degree of privacy that we would like to keep, a culture that we would like to remain and so on and so forth. So. There's nothing set yet. There's only um, research uh, activities that are happening and um, and that we can benefit from. Um, in your opinion, Victoria, just a, a question from my end. Uh, in Dubai, we see a lot of uh, uh, sort of facilities like the sport city, internet city, and other specialized areas. Uh, in your opinion, how does this affect sustainability in that area? Uh, if we're talking about manufacturing and production, it would. But if we're talking about uh, the area itself as a whole, as someone who can live, play and work in one location, I don't think, again, this um, idea of uh, zoning them and giving them themes would work. Uh, again, we, we are talking about really mixed use. We're talking about, um, you know, going uh, to your place of work, walking, uh, going to your gym, walking, going to the grocery job, uh, shop, walking. So. 
isolating these unless they are um, really they have uh, toxic or you know processes that needs to be isolated from uh, where everyone is. I don't think that's a that's a good idea. No, no. Um, we have also uh, I think another question. Um, thank you very much for an informative presentation. Due to the pandemic that we are currently facing. Is it possible to have hospital healthcare uh, health center within the building? I think that's yes, that's a very interesting question, and I expected that someone would would say that today. Uh, previously, we lecture a lot about uh, urban density, and we have never thought about this. And today, COVID nineteen uh, changed the way we look at urban density, right. and made us really question: Is density really the best way to go? Seeing that now we have to be socially distanced rather than socially dense together. But um, again, I think this is a very complex debate that we need to uh, to take. Do we compromise uh, health uh, during a short term pandemics like now, or do we compromise long term sustainability and long term uh, smartness and sustainability goals? Uh, this is this is a whole new talk that uh, that we could have, but uh, it's a very complex issue. But I, I agree, uh, the, the healthcare centers that we are trying to embed within those skyscrapers is not the isolation centers that we now have in COVID-19. We mean the places that you can go to if you have a high blood pressure or that um, you accidentally cut your finger in the kitchen or something like that, but not uh, for severe cases. Usually you have uh, specialized hospitals and larger hospitals that are away from this uh, center, but a very good question. Correct. Um, uh, another question is, is, is totally different. Uh, what is the ideal example in Bahrain when it comes to sort of the smart cities, I believe? Hmm. The reason why I presented Bahrain Bay because I think Bahrain Bay has the most potential to become smart, sustainable uh, city uh, or place to inhabit. But I don't think that there is um, really a good uh, national example that we can say that they have achieved everything. We have attempts here and there uh, they're certainly trying to work on uh, housing projects, affordable housing projects uh, to become more uh, sustainable. Uh, we have uh, good examples in the process, good and bad examples in the Princess uh, Charles Foundation uh, project in the Southern government. Uh, we have uh, attempts here and there, but uh, I, I don't think that we have a really one comprehensive project that we can call smart and sustainable in Bahrain yet. Hopefully Bahrain Bay will be. Um, another question from Hassan Tahami. Developers need to have a competitive edge over the competition. Buildings with more than two units need to form a homeowners, a homeowners association that would require monthly payment against exclusive benefits. Therefore, residents would rather have justifiable exclusive services against their fees. How can we address the mutual benefit to sustainable urbanism, resident comfort, and developers' benefits? I actually, so somebody will ask that, the developer's benefits uh, aspect. Thank you, Hassan. Hassan is my PhD student. Uh, thank you for coming, Hassan. Uh, actually, this is a very important debate um, that we need to have with the developers. Uh, in order for us to achieve this um, air planning model that I have presented, we have to get into negotiation with developers and really change the model of real estate that we work with today. We cannot uh, work with the existing model and achieve uh, our aspired goals of smartness and sustainability at the same time. So as I said, um, maybe the competitiveness in terms of services would listen because then the developer would know what services to have in their building and uh, they would know what services their neighbor would have. The competition would be to get that plot of land in the beginning, beginning of the project, that would have the services that they need to give them that competitive edge. Um, so if a developer is more interested about, um, as I said, healthcare or institutions like uh, schools or universities, they would choose the plot that would have that. And if a developer that is more interested in, um, in residential and offices and commercial would choose that plot uh, instead of this one. So the idea of competitiveness would change in this new model to begin with. And uh, coming to the homeowners association, this would be different because now you don't only have homeowners, but you have homeowners, uh, those with commercial activities and those with uh, offices and those with healthcare units all in the same building. It is no longer just residential towers, and that's what we're trying to eliminate. Nice. 
Um, just may I'll take another maybe uh, two questions before we actually conclude. Uh, what about the existing densely populated localities? Is there any way that any sustainable method be introduced there? Existing density populated localities. Um, do you mean does the I don't know who said that? Uh, Sudan? It's uh, Mr. Uh, Sudan Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm wondering whether uh, the person who asked the question means the existing uh, dense urban areas in Bahrain. Is that what's meant? Uh, I'll wait for their answer to. So introducing sustainability methods in existing dense areas. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is very possible, very tricky, and here we're talking about urban regeneration rather than uh, anything else, because you need to take uh, long term plans, you need to convince the people who are living there to uh, either move out by buying their plots and then regenerating the city to introduce more sustainable uses. Uh, so it's a, it's a very complex system. I think it's way more complex than uh, introducing sustainability and smartness in a newly developed areas because here you're you know, planning before you develop, but there you, you have already developed what you need to plan. And there are also a lot of complexities in terms of the, even um, yeah, I mean, the simplest things like um, uh, energy uses, because those buildings that are in already dense urban areas have not really been designed uh, you know, 100 years ago to be energy efficient or to have solar panels or to have any of that. So I think it's, um, it's a very complex issue and uh, more complex than uh, planning in a, in a newly area. But it can be done. Beautiful. Um, the to our last question, uh, just before we end the session, how do you see Bahrain business development in eight years? That's a question from Ali Youssef. Well, it's very hard to predict, certainly in these times now when we are seeing things uh, either too fast or too slow with COVID. Uh, things uh, really are unpredictable, as, I, as I've as uh, I shown in the slides, and if they have imagined uh, London in the year 2500 to be like that, or if they have imagined the you know, cities to be uh, uh, in the year uh, 19500 uh, to be in a certain way, how can we imagine how our cities to become? But I think, um, I think more certainly we would have a way stronger infrastructure. Because without uh, infrastructure, we wouldn't be able to have any of that. And talking about smart cities and the digitization of things and connectivity of things, I think one thing that we are sure of that we will have uh, better infrastructure than today. Uh, in, in terms of sustainability, we would have uh, for sure stronger regulations. And when we're talking about Bahrain, for instance, our sustainability regulations are not that uh, rigorous in comparison to other countries. And uh, just because, uh, for example, you don't need an environmental impact assessment in Bahrain to have a loan from a bank or to have an uh, you know, insurer to cover your project, but this would come in the future to the area and would enforce the developers and would enforce um, uh, others to take care of the environment because otherwise they wouldn't be getting the money. Yeah. So I think those modes uh, we will be starting to see in the next eight years, inshallah, Bahrain. Nice. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, I think uh, it was an extremely informative session, session. I actually benefited a lot from you, and I hope that our audience did benefit uh, a lot as well. Um, again, once again, thank you very much for taking part with us in this second series of the Real Estate Talks for this year at the BIBF. And we're going to hold another series, inshallah, in the next uh, in the coming two weeks. Uh, and we're going to host the Real Estate Regulatory Authority once again to speak about uh, quite an interesting topic uh, uh, relating to the real estate. Uh, thanks you, thank you very much, and uh, inshallah, we'll see you at the next session. Thank you very much, Ahmed. It was a pleasure to be with you here today. And there is a paper where I've got um, everything in the presentation today from that I can share with you, that you can uh, share with the audience if they wish to read it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.